ahead and turn to the book of Genesis chapter 1. We started a new series last Sunday. We started the book of Genesis and we covered verses 1 and 2, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. That was last Sunday. Today, we are going to finish the chapter and look at verses 3 through 31. I know that sounds like a big chunk of text, but uh, it's going to go very smoothly and uh, hopefully you'll be very encouraged as you leave this place today. So what we do is we go back to the beginning of time, the very first week of creation. And all of creation, everything that we know of that exists today, it all came to be in six days. And on the seventh day, God rested, right? That's the account given in the Bible. God created the heavens and the earth, every creature great and small. And not only did he create all these things, but his commentary on all that he created was, it is good. And so that's why I titled the message, All Was Good, because that was God's perspective of everything that he spoke into existence. That was his commentary on his work. He saw that it was good. You know, he's not capable of anything less, is he? I mean, he's never created anything bad. He doesn't make mistakes. Everything our God does is good and serves a good purpose. So let's now look at God's good creation. And so what we're going to look at today is the heaven, earth, and trees in verses 3 through 10. The sun, moon, and stars in verses 14 through 19. Living creatures are introduced in verses 20 to 25. And then God created something very special, man and woman. And we'll look at that in verses 26 through 31. So let's start with the heaven, the earth, and the trees, as we read from Genesis chapter 1, beginning of verse 3, all the way down to verse 10. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was what? It was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, we would call it sky or space. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb that yields seed and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass and the herb that yields seed according to its kind and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. So here we have the very first three days of creation of how the earth was formed and how light came to be and how growth came on the planet. But I'd like to remind ourselves of how these things, you know, started from the beginning. How, where did it all begin? And that's where we have to go back to verses 1 and 2 and see what God was working with. It says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we begin with an empty planet, a dark planet, so what does God do? Well, he brings light. And he then divides the light from the darkness 
So there's daytime and there's nighttime, there is morning and there is evening. Now something interesting, and some of you are scratching your heads. This is before he even created the sun and the moon. Before the sun and moon were created, there was already night and day. There was light and darkness. And you wonder, how can this be? How can there be light and darkness? And this is one of the arguments that are going to be thrown at you if you start discussing the creation account with some, you know, skeptic. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, did you ever read the Genesis account? There was light before there was even a sun or the moon. And, well, you know what? That's how it is in heaven. Did you know that in heaven there is no moon there either? There is no sun there either? That the light of God, the glory of God is the light in heaven? And did you know, and those of us who were with us during the Revelation series, you know this, that that's how it will be on earth when Jesus returns to make all things new. We read in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, the city, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, had no need of the sun or the moon. And here's why. For the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. And so it was on day one of creation. Do you think God needed a, a sun or a moon? No, he lit it up. You know, there was light. He said, let there be light, and it was good. And he divided the light from the darkness. Now, the next day, God divides the waters. So we see things getting separated. As, as one thing gets introduced, we see a, a separation, a, a division. The darkness and the light, they are divided, and then the waters above are separated from the waters below. Now, up to this point, earth was a watery mass. We saw that in uh, the first couple of verses, and we saw how uh, God's Spirit hovered over the face of these waters. So the waters were already in place, the waters above and the waters below. And God created this firmament to divide the water above from the water below. Now, firmament, if you were to look it up in the Strong's Concordance Dictionary in the Hebrew, you would see that that word means an expanse or a surface or a support. So this firmament, it served as a canopy. The waters above were held up in space, and earth became this massive greenhouse or like a gigantic terrarium if you will there was moisture to support plant life but it did not rain rain did not come until the days of Noah and you know he was a laughing stock because no one had ever heard of rain before Noah what are you doing what are you building this boat for it's gonna rain it's gonna do what Rain for 40 days? Uh, what's rain? You've got to explain that to me. So with the flood came the first rainfall. Now how do we explain or account for this downpour of water that just came flooding down for 40 days and 40 nights? Well, you see, once God removed that firmament, that's what happened, that firmament that he created, he removed that firmament, that canopy, and the waters all came crashing down. There really was a great flood. And debating against a global flood is a no-win because the fossil record insists that there was one. What is debated, perhaps, is the cause of this flood, and the answer is found in Scripture. God caused the flood. Before the flood, there were waters above, supported up in the sky by this canopy, a firmament created by God on day two. And notice how it says the evening and the morning were the second day. So we're looking at 24-hour periods. We're looking at literal 24-hour days. And on day three, God focuses on the waters below. And he causes them to pool into oceans. So we see more dividing happening. The water and the land are separated. 
And God calls these waters upon the land, he calls them seas. The earth is 70% water. And water is our most valuable resource on planet earth. God saw that the waters were good. And I'm here to persuade you to think the same way. I hope that you see these waters are rivers, lakes, and streams, and oceans and seas, that these waters are good, and God created them, and they were good, and that we need to see it that way. We are not being environmentalist wackos for caring about our globe. You know, you're almost felt to, you know, feel that way. You know, I know that I was in my younger years that only those, you know, crazy leftist tree huggers, you know, they, they're the only ones who care about the planet. You know, it's like, no, we're going to see how when God puts man on the planet, he tells us to be stewards over the earth, to take care of these things. You know, his creation, all of it was given unto us. And we are to be faithful stewards. We are to protect our waters and the sea life within them. And it breaks my heart, you know, when, you know, I pass by a river that's polluted or filled with beer cans or whatever. I mean, it's like, I hope that's not Christians doing that because part of our testimony is taking care of what God has entrusted us with. And, you know, you can preach Christ all day long, but I think when people see us not caring about the planet, it's a contradiction, and it doesn't help our witness. Okay, enough on that. With the waters pooled into seas, God then set his attention on the land. It was basically dirt on day two. By day three, it's covered in lush green. And notice that God did not start with seeds. He didn't start just throwing seeds in the dirt. Uh, he didn't do it that way. Everything was in a fully matured state in the beginning, all capable of bearing fruit or producing their own seeds. Notice that in verse 11. God said, let the earth Bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself. Put all that on the earth. So mature ground cover and trees, fruit bearing and seed bearing trees are all placed on the planet. Everything created according to its kind. I emphasize that. Everything was created according to its kind. In other words, oak trees did not evolve from moss. Mushrooms did not become apple trees. These things can change within their kind, but never something outside of their kind. A grass blade does not become a rose bush, nor does a rose bush become a cactus. There is no observable evidence of that happening. There's nothing in the fossil record to suggest that. God created everything according to its kind. Grass was grass, herbs were herbs, fruit trees were fruit trees. And God saw that it was good. And may we see his creation the same way. The Lord created all these things for us. He didn't do all this for the chickens and the cows, okay? All of this he was doing for you and I, for us. All this goodness sets the stage for his image bearers. Earth was to be habited uh, by you and me. This land was made for you and me. Okay. Um, all right, let's, let's go out into space a little bit. So we pick up in verse 14 and see how God created the sun, moon, and stars. Then, verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be, this is special, let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also, every one of them, folks. 
God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the first, uh, fourth day. The what? The evening and the morning. So we're talking about days. This wasn't billions of years or thousands of years. We're talking in a day. God can do that. He's pretty powerful. He doesn't need time to create. He doesn't need matter to create. He just speaks and bam, it happens. And God created the heavenly lights. He spoke them into existence, the sun, the moon, and the stars. The sun, of course, rules the day. The moon and stars, they rule at night. They became the means to measure time. Hours, days, weeks, months, years. And God said, let them be for signs and seasons. Typically, when we hear signs, you know, we're thinking of miraculous signs. Uh, that's not the case here. We're just talking about signs like when you're on the road and you see a sign that says 80 miles per hour and you're going 90, the sign is there to tell you that you really should be going 80. I know we laugh because we all, uh, I saw a tweet once, I saw a tweet of someone who was visiting Texas and it's like, you all can go 80 miles per hour and you still speed. It's like, <laughs> yep, that's how we roll here. The stars, in particular, became very useful signs, especially in ancient times before there were smartphones and Siri and Google Maps, and they needed the stars for navigation. Travelers would have been absolutely lost without the stars on a ship, a night voyage. How do you think that they navigated over the seas at nighttime? They relied on the stars. And then there were the Magi, of course, when they were seeking Jesus and you know, the Bible told where he was to be born. How did they find, you know, Bethlehem? The star. They came from the east, right? Chaldeans. They, they were ones who studied the stars. Uh, Daniel was, you know, when he was uh, abducted by the Chaldeans, you know, that's what he was being trained for. And so travelers relied heavily on the stars, and stars were also used to discern the seasons, observing the constellations. Okay, which, where's the constellation today? Where's this particular constellation? Where is it at? You know, so they would, you know, observe these constellations, when they would appear, and where they would be seen, or how they would be positioned, or if they could be seen at all, and this one's more prominent, so that tells me it's this time of year, and so forth. And of course, it's from these constellations that the zodiac signs, uh, you know, come from. And did you know that these signs uh, and their positioning, as far as the zodiac, they're known in every language and every culture? They were not put there for fortune telling. God speaks against that. They're not there for, you know... Uh, astrology so you can read your horoscope in the back of a magazine. A astrology is not from God. Now these constellations are from God. And astronomy, the study of stars, there's nothing unbiblical about that. I, you know, that's, that's something important. Obviously, we, we need people to study the stars so they could navigate and travel at night. So the study of stars, astronomy, that, that, that's all biblical. But this business of trying to figure out, you know, what your life is going to be like by, you know, going by, am I a Leo or a Pisces or whatever, forget it. You're a Christian. What sign were you born under? The cross, okay? Good enough. Amen. You know, what's fascinating about the stars, and as telescopes become more sophisticated and more sophisticated, even in recent days, the more that they look out there, the more they see that there's more to explore, and there's just, they, they just keep going. And, and the Bible attests to that, that the stars, they're just too numerous to, ca uh, to count. 
You know, Abraham was promised uh, that his, his descendants would outnumber the stars and that there are even more stars than there is sand on the seashore. I mean, think about that. I mean, try and count the sand. <laughs> it's impossible, right? And it's impossible to count the stars in the sky, and yet Scripture states that God has all the stars numbered, every one of them, and not only does he have all the stars numbered, he has a name for each and every one of them. That's our God. And the stars, they have a story to tell. We read in Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language with their vo where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of the uh, heaven and its circuit to the other end. Sorry, flat earthers. Its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So the heavens declare his glory. That's the beautiful thing about, you know, what we see out there in space. I mean, it speaks of a creator. There's just no way all of this could have just accidentally exploded into existence. It declares his glory. But there's only so much that the heavens can declare. It can declare an intelligent designer, an awesome God. But it cannot declare the gospel. That's where we come in. We speak where the heavens are silent. The heavens do their job and then we do ours. Now, while the stars served as a calendar, time was ruled by the sun and the moon. God set these particular lights at an exact distance, a perfect distance from the earth. If the sun were any closer or further, life would be absolutely unsustainable. If the sun were any closer, you and I would be toast. If it was any further, we would be Italian ice or whatever. I, you know, we'd be Frosty the Snowman. And such precision can only come from design. Well, let's look further at God's design in the living creatures as we pick up in verse 20. Then God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So we're now at day five. So far, so good. The environment was, is good. The atmosphere is good. Good for what? Living creatures. Swimming creatures, flying creatures. God populated the land, the water, the sky with life. Creatures that swim, soar, wiggle and walk. Birds, fish, and land animals. Each according to its kind. This phrase is used ten 
times in the creation account. Now, God created variation within each kind. There's all kinds of birds, there's all kinds of fish, all kinds of canines, and all kinds of felines. But one kind does not become another. Dogs don't become cats, mice don't become kangaroos, and so on. The theory of evolution was initially based on Darwin's observation of finches on the island of Galapagos. He noticed something about these finches, that their beaks came in all kinds of shapes and sizes. There was variance within the kind, but there were no tuna finches there were no finch gators. Darwin's biggest opponents were the fossil experts. And even Darwin himself admitted that the fossil record was, in his words, the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. It's Darwin who said that. I got no answer for the, the fossil experts. You know, it's, that, that's my greatest hurdle. The fossil records, you see, they attest to the fact that species do not change outside of their kind. Pick a species, any species at all, the, the oldest and most recent fossil are the same. Those who study fossils call this stasis. Fossils support sudden appearance. Species don't come to be gradually. They appear abruptly and fully formed. There's no evidence of one species transitioning to another in the fossil record, and there's no evidence of that happening here today. We, we have, you know, people here today. We don't have half monkey half people here. There are people. Why don't we see these transitional species today? Where are the intermediaries between, you know, this species and that species? You just don't find it. And where did all these species come from? The simple answer is God created it all. He created all the creatures, great and small. He created them fully formed with the ability to reproduce, to fill the earth. He gave each and every one of these creatures a divine purpose to be fruitful and to multiply and see how the earth has been filled each according to their kind. And then finally, God created man and woman. Let's pick up in verse 26 and read down to the end of the chapter. Then God said, let us, circle us, make man in our, and you can circle that one too, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female. You can circle that one too. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed which is on the face of all the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be food so notice that everything that God created he's giving it to man and woman I'm, I've made all this for you also to every beast of the earth to every bird of the air and everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life I have given every green herb for food and it was so and then God saw that he had made, and indeed, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day, final day of creation. God said, let us make man in our image. Let us 
Was God speaking into a mirror? Let's uh, make man in our image. No, this was a discussion, an agreement among the Trinity. Here we see the Trinity, God in three persons, a plural God. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We are unlike any other creature. You and I, we bear the image of our creator. That's what separates us from all other creatures. We were created in his likeness. The big question is how? How are we like God? Do we have the same physical appearance? When we meet him one day, is he going to look like us? Is he going to have two eyes, a nose, and uh, a long white hair, or two arms? Is, is he going to have a physical body like us? No, that's not how we are image bearers of God. Unlike other creatures, we were created with a spirit. We were created because we have this spirit. We were created with the ability to do good and to know righteousness and to love and to have meaningful relationships. All other creatures operate on this thing called instinct. On the other hand, we can reason, we can think things through. Rather than instinct, we operate on will. We can will to do good, and we can will to love. Love is non-existent apart from free will. Relationships are meaningless without love. And it's love that prompts us to do good, to make right choices, to live righteously. We're unique in this way. Love and goodness are the godlike qualities that you and I possess. Love and goodness make us like Him. The commands to love God and to love others weren't given, those commands weren't given to the animal kingdom. They wouldn't know what to do with them. I tried it with our pet dog, Neil. Love one another, Neil. He doesn't get it. As image bearers, we get that. We understand it. As his image bearers, we are superior to all other creatures. We were given, as we saw in our passage, we were given dominion over them. Everything on this planet was put here for us, or as it says in verse 29, God saying, I have given you. Highlight that. I have given you all of it. And then God, he truly saved his best for last. His creation. He created all these things. Light and the earth and land and sea and the stars and the sun and the moon and the flying creatures and the swimming creatures and then the, the land creeping creatures and all of it. And then he saves his best for last. He creates man and woman. He created a he and a she. A man and a woman. And when he breathed his breath into the life of man... He breathed his likeness into us. We became his best work. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, one of my favorite verses, we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he created us for a good purpose, a purpose 
that he established for us before the foundations of the earth. We are his workmanship. Now that word, it kind of sounds a little technical in the English, and the original is, we are his poemia, where we get our word poetry. And it was a word that was used to describe a masterpiece. In other words, you know, of all of a person's creation, there would be that that thing that really represented himself, his masterpiece. You go into an artist's studio. Maybe he sculpts and you look at all these amazing works. Wow, he did this and he did that and he did this. And what, What's that one sell for? Oh, $30,000. What about that one? $50,000. It's like all this amazing work. What about that one? That one is not for sale. That one is my masterpiece. This is the one that reflects who I am. And this is the one I want everybody to see. And this is the one I put high on the mantle so that people can recognize and see me in it. This is my masterpiece. And that's what that verse is saying, Ephesians 2.10. We are his masterpiece, his work of art, of all the things he created. And think of all the things that he created, all the things we've seen so far. He's the one who flung the stars in the sky, the sun and the moon. You ever go out late at night on a clear day and just gaze at the stars and wow, God, that is amazing what you did. Maybe you see the constellations and it's like, oh God, you did that. I'm just looking at that picture right now with the tree and the stars. God, you did that. You did that. That's your most marvelous work. Oh no, not even close. Or, or the sun. You, you go to a beautiful place and maybe you watch it rise or maybe you watch it set and it's like, God, oh man, well, that's just amazing. Christy and I, we've been to the Caribbean and we, it was like the sun was right in front of us as it's uh, set on the ocean. It's like, oh God, you did that. That's your most amazing creation. Oh no, not even close. Or maybe you're looking at the, uh, the animal life and maybe you've done a safari in Africa, and you look at the zebra, and you look at the giraffe, and you look at the lion and the leopard. Oh, God, these are such precious, beautiful animals. I can't believe it. They're just so so amazing. You did that. What a work of art. That's your most beautiful creation. God say, no, no, uh uh-uh. Not even close. We look at the trees. Maybe some of you have driven up the California coast and the further up you go, the bigger the redwoods get and they're just so massive and you can't even see the tops of them. They're just so amazing and so beautiful. Oh, those trees, they're just so phenomenal. They're amazing. They're beautiful. God, your greatest creation. There it is. I found it right on the ocean bluffs of Northern California. There's the ocean so beautiful, the trees so beautiful. Oh God, you did that, a work of art, the most beautiful thing you've ever created oh no uh uh-uh not even close of all the things God created you are his masterpiece you are his poemia you are his expression you are his image bearer and nothing else is No other creature is. You were created to be his image bearer. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now this good image that man was given was marred after the fall. We'll see that later on in Genesis. How Adam and Eve, they partook of the forbidden fruit And that image, that perfect image of God was marred after the fall and something in them died. That spirit that God put into mankind that he didn't put into any other creature. And and this caused us to be distant from our creator and less like him. And yet God in his mercy and grace and his love and his goodness, he made a way for that to be corrected. He made a way for us to be reconnected 
the separation that was caused by sin and our fallen nature. There's a way to, to, to overcome that, and that way is Jesus Christ. And so God made a way for our relationship with him to be restored, for our sins to be forgiven, and that dead part of us to be born again, that we could be born of the Spirit. And when we are born of the Spirit, the masterpiece that was so cracked becomes restored and it becomes whole. And once again, we are reflecting that good image of God that can only be restored in the person of Jesus Christ. In Christ, we bear his image. And that's the six days of creation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Oh, Lord, I get a little worked up talking about these things. I suppose that's a good thing. I I pray that we would all be excited and rejoice in your good work. And all that you've created for us, we look around and everything that we see, all of nature and all its beauty, whether it be the oceans or the trees or birds or the fish, all of it for us because you love us that much. And Lord, that you would choose us to be your image bearers. That you would have that high and holy of a purpose for us. Uh, We're humbled by that. And uh, it just causes us to want to worship you all the more. Oh, we worship you. Lord, that's something that only we can do. No other creature can do that. No other creature is capable of that. No other creature knows you like we do. And we can worship. We can draw close to you and and, and just sing our hearts out and lift up holy hands or fall to our face or whatever it is. But we can worship, draw close to you. And we thank you, Lord, that You have made a way for us to be restored. That that fallen nature can be corrected in Christ Jesus. That through you we can become those loving conduits and know to do good and live to be righteous. And I pray for those that do not know you. Oh, if there's any here that don't know you, Lord. If there's any here who doubt that their life has meaning or purpose. If there's any here who believes that it's just here today and gone tomorrow and that's that. I I pray for them. I pray for any here, any who are listening or watching online. And if that's you, if you have never given your life to God, if you don't know him, if you're not walking with him, if you don't have a relationship with him, I want to assure you that there is hope. If you don't have the hope of heaven, I want to assure you that you can have it now. And that hope, that assurance, comes by way of Jesus Christ. And if you're ready to accept him as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you in a prayer. Make this your prayer. Dear Lord, I confess that I have not been living for you, that I'm far from you, distant. I confess that it's my sin that keeps me from you. And so I'm sorry. I ask your forgiveness. And I receive your provision for forgiveness, for salvation, for cleansing. I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. I want to become a new creation today. And I believe in Jesus. I believe what the Bible says about Jesus, what your word says about Jesus. I believe that Jesus came to this earth. 
and walked among men. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and he died for the sins of the world. I believe that he was buried. And I believe that on the third day, he rose again. And I believe that Jesus ascended to the right hand side of the Father. And I believe that Jesus is going to return. And I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. Today I declare Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I declare that you are my God and that I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. It was the most important decision you've ever made in your life. And if you're watching online, you made that decision, let us know. Give us an email at info at calvaryaustin.com. Or if you're here, you can just come up after the service and say, hey, guess what? I gave my heart to the Lord today. And if you need prayer for anything at all, there'll be several of us up here to pray with you. We'd love that opportunity.